to everyone who has registered thus far. So if you're going to do that, like, decide today and go ahead and do it. That makes sense, right? Totally reasonable? Okay. All right. The other thing you need to know about this upcoming week is that I will be leaving town on Saturday. Our pension fund is sponsoring a gathering for clergy in Washington, D.C., which is really far away. Um, so I will be flying out there on Saturday. You will have a very charming guest preacher next Sunday. Her name is Reverend Katie Whipple Hatlevig. She is a Presbyterian uh, chaplain, um, but she also has served congregations. She will probably be bringing her five-year-old and her baby with her. So I hope that you all will be well uh, prepared to assist her with whatever she may need. The nursery has been alerted. So um, Katie's husband is de uh, deployed with the Navy, so he will not be here to help her. So you all will be here to help her, and she will bring you a good word. So I think that is just about all, except that we do want to lift up that today, this very day, is both Paul Epler's birthday for reals and Harley Hannah's birthday. And Friday is Michelle's birthday. You have to stand on your chair and dance around. You know that, right? <laughs> you can stand up, Joe. No, really. It's a requirement until you're like 77. If you're over 77, you don't have to stand up. But Friday is also Mike and Lisa Martin's anniversary, so you could send them a text so they know that we love them. But right now, let's sing to Michelle. <coughs> Before 
we come to worship God, to reconcile ourselves one to another, the peace of Christ be with you. Also with you. God, I share those signs of peace. Amen and amen. I invite you to stand now as you are comfortable and join in singing our gathering song, number 284, verses 1 through 3, Gather Us In.
not have noticed. Uh-oh. Yeah, okay. It's not the batteries. This little box has been killing batteries. This little box has been killing batteries for three weeks now. So oh. this is interesting. Hmm. <laughs> Luckily, I have this right here. So um, in case you hadn't noticed, there's someone who's not on Zoom today because he's in the room. Good morning, Daniel. Hi. Say, say good morning. Good morning. <laughs> God loves you, Daniel. All right. And who do we have on Zoom this morning, Michaela? Um, we have Betty, Betty, Kathy, Kathy, Claudette, Claudette, Glenda, Glenda, and Lynn. And Lynn. All right. And possibly Grace in the background, but not probably Bill because he's also in the room. All right. Good morning, Zoomers. Good morning. God loves you, Zoomers. And God loves you, church. I am grateful that you are all with us one way or the other. Let us move now into a time of prayer as we share the joys and concerns of this community and beyond. We are continuing to pray with Brenda Rory Beatty. Prayers of Thanksgiving mostly this morning, as far as I am aware. As you know, Brenda went back uh, to Stanford Court in Santee, but with hospice care, and she has blossomed. She told my husband on Friday that she's eating like a horse, <laughs> uh, which I'm pretty sure isn't quite true, but apparently everyone there has been very, uh, very happy with um, how much she is eating. She really wasn't before. She wouldn't even let them bring the meal in, so this is a big deal. She's got people who show up with guitars and sing songs with her. Um, so it really has been a wonderful blessing. So let us be a lesson to all of us about saying yes to hospice, whatever it's offered, because mm -hmm. it's wonderful. But let us give thanks uh, that Brenda is doing so very well. God, mm -hmm. with joyful hearts, we mm -hmm. give you thanks. Some thanks as well for most of Sandy Hannah's family. Her sister Sharon had a pacemaker installed and is doing better. Uh, her mother-in-law Brenda is doing some better. She had been in and out of the hospital with undiagnosed extreme weakness uh, following some surgery. Um, and her boyfriend Jeff, who's dealing with heart issues, is feeling better, I think. So that some of that is very good, although still somewhat tenuous. God with joyful hearts. We give you thanks, but we do want to continue to pray fervently for um, Sandy's sister, Shelly, who she found out this week has basically been told she has 0% lung capacity, uh, which sounds impossible, um, so not quite sure what that means, but she is on oxygen all the time on a BiPAP machine at night um, and has been put on a lung transplant list, so... Prayers for Sandy's sister, Shelly, who is in Illinois, along with her sister, Sharon, and other family. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. I want to pray uh, for Andy's mother-in-law, Amy's mom, Sandy, who uh, fell last weekend-ish. So uh, a little over a week ago. A little over a week and, uh, ago. She had a put in. Broke her hip. Yeah. yeah. A lot better. And due to the short-term memory loss, she has no idea she broke her hip. Okay, okay, so. Back at Bridgeport, uh, the care facility? Yes. Okay. In an inpatient uh, oh. rehab facility. Okay, okay, so so Amy's mom, Sandy, fell, broke her hip, had surgery, doesn't remember it, um, and is back in rehab at, at her care facility. Amy flew out there on Tuesday. Do we know when she's coming back yet? Uh, I talked to her yesterday. She may extend for like another week or so. Okay. She's going to come back about Tuesday. Okay, okay, so prayers for uh, Amy's mom, Sandy, and uh, for Amy as she's there uh, with her sister to help to give care. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Uh, and this is like, just because I didn't say it about two weeks ago when we should have, uh, Mary Lynn's mom, Marianne Eagle, had a fall kind of in the middle of the night and got a pretty bad cut on her leg that... EMTs got called and were like, yes, you need to go to the place. Um, so she had to go in and get some stitches, I think. Oh. And, um, but got home, uh, you know, later that morning and um, is recovering. But just belated prayers uh, for Mary Ann uh, recovering from that cut on her leg. God, in your mercy. Yeah. 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 Continuing to pray for Lynn and Grace Van Winkle. I don't know if she's put anything in the chat box. No. They are recovering from COVID. It is a slow recovery. Uh, Lynn told me yesterday, she said, it seems I just feel lousy every morning. So 
Um, we know that taking that recovery slow and easy is the only thing that's going to make it get better. So we continue to surround Lynn and Grace and any other family that may have come down with it in our prayers. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. I want to give thanks for the dedicated leaders who were at our leadership retreat this weekend, um, Friday and on Saturday. I thought we had a really good time, so we had some tasty food, had some good conversations, set some things in motion. So I want to give thanks for the leadership of this intrepid little congregation. God, with joyful hearts, we give you thanks. I want to also uh, celebrate with uh, Tim and Karen. Uh, their grandson, Julian, turned one this past week. We forgot, we, it was me. I forgot to say that last week. He has the same birthday as Glenda. Um, I mean, 98 was a big deal. So what's one? One is one. Uh, so they were up there yesterday for a party and then actually ended up staying because I forget exactly how they're related, but an in-law of Brittany's is having a 99th birthday party today. So Tim and Karen stayed up to celebrate all the ends of the spectrum of life this weekend. So great aunt. We, we, great aunt. There we go. Uh, we rejoice with them. God with joyful hearts. We give you thanks. thanks. We continue to pray for those impacted by wildfires and summer storms all around the world and in our own state. God, in your mercy. We continue to pray for the catastrophic humanitarian crisis in Gaza, for a war that uh, just seems to go on and on, um, where neither side will relent on their demands, uh, where things seem to be spreading, bombings in, in Lebanon just in the last 24 hours. Uh, we pray for peace. We pray for the softening of the hearts of those who make war. We pray for those whose motivations are other than the good of their people, whose motivations are selfish and callous. We pray for peace. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for all those impacted by conflicts, by violence, tensions, and unrest. In Ukraine, Congo, Sudan, Ethiopia, Venezuela, South China Sea, so many places around the world. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray each week for our ministry partners, our official ministry partners, and all the other ones too. Our global ministries prayer partner this week is India, where Ms. Annie Namala serves as director of the Center for Social Equity and Inclusion, our mission partner there. And our Pacific Southwest Regional Prayer Partner is Claremont Christian Church here in San Diego, which as far as I can tell may not have a pastor right now. I couldn't find a name and the region doesn't have one either. So we know that that Claremont Church has been very uh, insulated, but let us Send the love of our hearts to them this morning and this week. God, in your mercy. Are there other things we can lift up today? Can I get one more person on the mic? Thank you, Bill. Go ahead, Amy. I found out yesterday that my almost son-in-law was in the hospital for two weeks. And this morning I got a message from my daughter. He was home for 12 hours and she had to call an ambulance and send him back to the hospital. He had a biopsy on his lung and they're trying to find out why he's coughing blood mm -hmm. and all of this. And they both need prayers because okay. Dolly is, she cook and bottle washer and work and takes care of him and he doesn't like to be left in the hospital alone, but she has to work. It's his name We're, is Jim. Yeah. Jim. Okay. And Dolly does a lot. Yeah. <laughs> she does as much as she can to help him. Sure, sure. He, he had a stroke many years ago, so things like so. His whole system is messed up, and when he gets something bad, it's really bad, and it's different than normal people get. Okay. Okay. So fervent prayers uh, for Eileen's daughter Dolly and for her. Uh, we're going to call him your son in love, because yeah. even if it's not law, it's love. Yeah. Uh, for Jim, who has been in the hospital, came home, is back in the hospital, 
has lots going on, um, coughing up blood, all, all the normal things are more complicated for him. So just big prayers for Jim and for Dolly, who is uh, juggling many things, including taking care of him. God, in your mercy, we can hear our prayer. Thank you, Lord, you got anything? No. Okay. Anything else we can share this morning? Right here, Cheryl. Um, prayers for Kathy, a Women from a Women's Connection group who was in the ER yesterday, um, probably had kidney stones, so prayers for her, and prayers in general for the women of, of Afghanistan, for Namadi Hello, she's speaking, but mm -hmm. okay. prayers for the women of Afghanistan. Okay, so prayers for a friend of Cheryl's named Kathy, who is in ER with uh, probable kidney stones. Steve, that direction, yes. Prayers for Kathy, dealing with uh, kidney stones. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And fervent prayers for the women of Afghanistan, who, as we know, have been barred from school, barred from jobs, barred from the streets, and now barred from even speaking in public. Uh, we know that this is not right, and we send our, our strength and our hope and our love to them. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Steve? I'm pleased to report that Renee has resigned officially. Her regional minister, interim regional minister responsibilities affected the regional assembly in uh, Oregon, Southwest Idaho at the end of September, mm -hmm. which means in October you will see her again. Yeah. All right. She's so. coming out of, out of looking to try her hand at retirement again. Again, yes. This time it probably will stick. I love that you think that. Okay. <laughs> All right. So we rejoice with Renee, who is embracing retirement again, stepping down from her position as interim regional minister in Oregon, Southwest Idaho. Uh, as of the end of September, when they are uh, having uh, their regional assembly, we give thanks that we will see her then with us here in October. God with joyful hearts, we give you thanks. Jerry? I don't know what I was going to say, but I'm not sure. Anyway, <laughs> we have joy. We're having 14 family members for dinner Tuesday night. Grandson from uh, Wednesday. 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 All right, it's different night. Wednesday. This, this, this week. week. This week. <laughs> Sometime. Uh, grandson who's in the Air Force and his wife and a new baby, well, eight months now. That's pretty uh, good. <clears throat> will be in town. We haven't seen him for a couple of years. And uh, this is <coughs> prelude to being transferred from Colorado to Georgia. When he makes that transition, he's got a few days to stop and by. Remind us of his name. And the rest of them are coming. Remind us of the, his name, your grandson? Jesse. Jesse, okay. Jesse Antel. Okay. Sergeant, sniper, whatever. Okay. He's your grandson, so we're going to call him Jesse. All right. <laughs> so we, we give thanks with Jerry and Norma, who will have lots of family in town this week um, to visit with their grandson, Jesse, and his uh, wife and New to you, baby. Um, they haven't seen the family in a couple of years, so here uh, on a transition from Colorado to Georgia. So we give thanks for that opportunity to be with family. God, with joyful hearts, we give you thanks. Let us continue in prayer. Holy and gracious God, we come to you this morning with hearts that are full, hearts that are all over the place. As per usual, God, we bring it all to you, for we know that in your wisdom and in your mercy, all falls into place. We give you thanks this morning for all your many blessings, for the gift of family and friends, for food on our tables, for shelter over our heads, for a safe place to find rest, oh God. We give you thanks this morning for the gift of this church, for this place where so many people find a, a home, God, a safe place to be, a sign of hope and help, 
for this church as community, oh God, for the community of faith that we are part of here, each of us, God, bringing what we can, bringing who we are, heart, soul, strength, and mind, God, we bring it to you all here to be your people, called together in the name of your Christ. We give you thanks for the ministry that you invite us into, for the table where you feed our souls, for the invitation to go forth from this place bearing the light, the hope, the love, the good news, the joy of Christ. We come to you this morning asking your blessing for all those who are hurting, those who are struggling with illnesses and injuries, with chronic conditions, with mental health challenges. We ask your healing, O oh God. We ask your presence. We ask your comfort. We pray this day for those who mourn, who mourn those who are still here and yet gone, and who mourn those who have moved on completely, God. Be with us in our sorrow. Help up those who need your help in their grief. We pray this day that you would be with all those who are struggling, those who are trying to feed their families, those who are trying to make ends meet, those who are living rough, God, in the heat, in the cold, in the wind. We pray, O oh God, for your people. We pray for those looking for work, for those looking for housing, we pray for our community leaders, O oh God, that they might have your wisdom and your compassion guiding them in every decision. We pray this day for refugees and asylum seekers, for all those who've had to flee for their very lives in the face of guns and bombs and repression. We pray, O oh God, for your peace. We pray for your peace. We pray for your peace. God, we ask that you would soften the hearts of those who make war, that your mercy would flow throughout our world, O oh God, bringing all of us back into right relationship with you and with one another. We pray this day for all those whose lives have been torn apart by earthquakes, by storms, by fires. For all those struggling to survive in the midst of famine and drought, we pray, O oh God, for your healing, for your hope, for your help. We pray for the healing of creation itself. We ask that you might inspire us to be faithful stewards of all your many blessings, O oh God. Send us forth from this place, neither unbothered nor helpless. Send us forth to be your people carrying the good news of Christ. For it is in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Our first reading today is Psalm 84. It begins on page 543 in the Old Testament section of the Red Bible in the Tourette, if you'd like to follow along that way. How lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord of hosts! My soul longs, indeed it faints for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh sing for joy to the living God. Even the sparrow finds a home, and the swallow a nest for herself where she may lay her young at your altars, O Lord of hosts, my King and my God. Happy are those who live in your house, ever singing your praise. Happy are those whose strength is in you, in whose heart are the highways of Zion. As they go through the valley of Baca, they make it a place of springs. The early rain also covers it with pools. They go from strength to strength, the God of gods will be seen in Zion. O oh Lord God of hosts, hear my prayer. Give ear, O oh God of Jacob. Behold our shield, O oh God. Look on the face of your anointed. For a day in your courts is better than a hundred elsewhere. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than live in the tents of wickedness. 
For the Lord God is a sun and shield. He bestows favor and honor. No good thing does the Lord withhold from those who walk uprightly. O oh Lord of hosts, happy is everyone who trusts in you. May the Holy Spirit add blessing to the reading of the Psalms. Well, I'm still here. Um, <laughs> this is not really a traditional faith story. What I'm here to do today is to tell everybody a little bit about our adult study, about the way we've been doing it, and the way we're going to continue to be doing it. For those who may not know what that process has been like for the people who've been doing it. Um, there's a faithful group who gathers, and I know that getting here at 9 o'clock does not work for everybody all the time. So number one, you don't have to come every time to be part of it, and if you'd like to be part and can't be here at 9, you can join on Zoom because we do have it connected through Zoom every week as well, unless there's a technical difficulty. <laughs> um, so this is what happens. We have several different Bibles. When I say different, I mean very different. There are different translations, different interpretations, and also um, different kinds of commentaries for all kinds of questions that people might have, whether that's even just a very basic one about geography or about name pronunciation, or whether it is about what various scholars and theologians have had to say about the passage that we're reading at the time. So I'm going to show you a few of the different Bibles that we use and you can choose whichever one you want every week when you come. And if you prefer your own, and, and you have a study Bible or translation that you like, just bring that, or use that if you're on Zoom. So, this one is the First Nations version of the New Testament, an indigenous translation. The story's not changed, the meaning's not changed, but it gives the addition of the kind of customs, traditions, and culture of some of the first peoples. So that, for example, Jesus is always referred to as creator sets free in the type of naming tradition that exists in those cultures where people are not named something arbitrarily it's something that has to do with their character, nature, and behavior. So this, this is one that has been very interesting and is much beloved by the people who've been coming so far. Um, this one is called the Inclusive Bible. And amongst the other features of the Inclusive Bible is the... Um, is the lack of use of any gender kinds of pronouns. Um, just one of the features of it. So the Inclusive Bible is another one that we have available. We have some classic study and commentary Bibles as well. We have the People's Bible. We have the Message for people who like that kind of version. So there, that's what we have, as well as these wonderful little markers for where we are so that we don't remember, so that we don't forget where we left off. <laughs> um, but the really important thing about this, it's important to me and I've heard that it's important to many people and maybe somebody will stand up briefly and tell us about its importance to her, is the fact that it is community and that we gather together and when we gather together with this purpose, the spirit is among us and it is felt, I think, by all who are present. It is an opportunity. We don't just read. We reflect on what we read. We respond to what we read. And any response, any question, any idea is fair game, as well as the sharing of anything that might happen to be in your annotated Bible that you're looking at. Um, I want to ask if, if she wouldn't mind, Mariana, could you just share for a moment what the, you know, what the importance of this has been to you? Well, I, 
I want you to be able to hear me. <clears throat> if you don't come to a class on Bible study, you're missing um, so much because as important as it is to be preached to, to come and sit in a circle where it doesn't matter if you've never cracked open a Bible on your own for devotional study question or preparation, it doesn't matter because it's a great leveler. But together, we have hundreds of years of wisdom. And it doesn't matter if you've just come one time, or if you come regularly, or if you come as the Spirit moves you, or you have energy that day to get here. You're welcome. And, and, and God works through us all as we share our collective experience with the Word of God. And the Word of God is a living thing. And Jesus Christ is a living teacher and friend and Savior. So I would encourage you, as a lifelong student, I started being uh, dragged to Sunday school when I was two, and it opened the world for me. And I know that when people sit in a circle, whether we're on the Zoom end of the circle or sitting at the table, something happens when we pause and are given opportunity to wonder and to listen and to express the diversity of the faith experience of honest people um, pondering together and wondering and thinking and sharing faith and, and the mystery of belief. It's a real blessing. So I invite you wholeheartedly as a teacher, as a retired pastor, and just as another kid at the table uh, when Jesus said, let the children come. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> so we start again on September 8th. It runs from 9 o'clock to 10 o'clock in the morning. And this time we have finally spent several months going through Mark, and now we are tackling 1 Corinthians, which I think it has a lot for us in it. So let me close just by sharing a line or two from Henri Nouwen, um, from his uh, You Are the Beloved uh, Daily Meditations, from his many, many, many writings. So he says, community um, is the grateful recognition of God's call to share life together and the joyful offering of a hospitable space where the recreating power of God's spirit can become manifest. So thank you all. conversation yesterday the leadership retreat about when applause is appropriate in worship so I may take it upon myself to just start doing it whenever I feel like it just to mess with you but we'll see and that's not really why we're here so I'm gonna see oh look this little black box works better so let's hope it keeps it up our second reading today is from the Gospel according to John, as you knew, chapter 6, as you knew, verses 47 through 71. You can find it on pages 98 and 99 in the New Testament section of the Red Bibles in the chair racks if you'd like to follow along. We're actually overlapping ever so slightly uh, from the end of what we heard last week, uh, just to make, <laughs> I was going to say, just to make this part make more sense. Not sure it's going to help, but we're going to try. John 6, 47 through 71. Very truly, I tell you, whoever believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness, and they died. This is the bread that comes down from heaven so that when they eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats of this bread will live forever, and the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. The Jews then disputed among themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? So Jesus said to them, Very truly, I tell you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Those who eat my flesh and drink my blood have eternal life, and I will raise them up on the last day, for my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. Those who eat my flesh and drink my blood abide in me, and I in them. 
Just as the living Father sent me and I live because of the Father, so whoever eats me will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven, not like that which your ancestors ate and they died, but the one who eats this bread will live forever. He said these things while he was teaching in the synagogue at Capernaum. When many of his disciples heard it, they said, This teaching is difficult. Who can accept it? But Jesus, being aware that his disciples were complaining about it, said to them, Does this offend you? And what if you were to see the Son of Man ascending to where he was before? It is the Spirit that gives life. The flesh is useless. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and life. But among you there are some who do not believe. For Jesus knew from the first who were the ones that did not believe and who was the one that would betray him. And he said, For this reason I have told you that no one can come to me unless it is granted by the Father. Because of this, many of his disciples turned back and no longer went about with him. So Jesus asked the twelve, Do you also wish to go away? Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom can we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe and know that you are the Holy One of God. Jesus answered them, Did I not choose you, the twelve? Yet one of you is a devil. He was speaking of Judas, son of Simon Iscariot, for he, though one of the twelve, was going to betray him. May the Holy Spirit add blessing to this reading. From the gospel. Will you pray with me and for me as we move into the word together? Holy God, bless the speaking and the hearing of these words that our hearts might be made courageous, that we might indeed have new life in Christ. We pray in Jesus' name. We've been working our way through John 6 all month. I read you the whole thing at the beginning, so you knew this was coming. But here we are again, back at the part we might prefer to avoid. The translators of the New Revised Standard Version have the disciples calling Jesus' monologue here difficult. I believe the word I used three, years, three weeks ago was squicky which Microsoft Word still doesn't think is a word, uh, but it feels more accurate to me. I guess not everyone is as squeamish as I am, but it's pretty squicky in here. Now, before we get too far into things, I need to tell you about my nephew's visit last weekend. I, he's a 15-year-old boy. He works at a church, so I gave him the Sunday off, didn't bring him to see you, but he was here. He, he's a 15-year-old boy, right? So he likes he likes being up high, so we decided we would visit the California Tower on Saturday. Now, in case you're not familiar, that's the really tall tower in Balboa Park, up above the Museum of Us, the Anthropology Museum. Tours of the tower are scheduled throughout the day to go up the 125 steps to the viewing deck on the 8th floor. But in order to get a ticket to go up the tower, you have to also get a ticket to the Museum of Us itself. So we did that. It's a pretty good deal, really. One ticket gets you a year-long membership if you sign up. We had arranged our afternoon so that we could look around the museum before our tour to make sure we weren't late to go up the tower. Now, the museum itself is not that big, so they often have a special exhibit in the building across the street. I don't know if you've been in Balboa Park recently, but if you have been, you might have noticed that the special exhibit across the street right now is all about cannibalism. Yeah. I am confident that you will forgive me for not being able to report on the details of this exhibit, because I was... I was distracted by keeping track of the time and honestly a little trepidatious about what I might not be able to unsee if I got too far into the fine print. But here's an important trend I did notice. Much of the material covered 
in, in the exhibit was history from what was possibly called the age of exploration when many of us were in school. And far more common than Western explorers finding actual evidence of indigenous tribes consuming human flesh were reports that it seemed like they probably did. It turns out that accusing a population of being man-eaters was a surefire way to justify enslaving them and taking their land. Imperialism 101, bringing up cannibalism is the quickest pathway to dehumanization. But you already knew that, didn't you? We know that in our gut, without even having to be told. Consuming human flesh is the ultimate taboo, the thing that immediately proves definitive otherness. But Jesus took it one step further, didn't he? Because if there's anything we hate more than the idea of someone eating human flesh, it's the idea of being eaten ourselves. In a world of eat or be eaten, being eaten means that you are the loser. And we might hate losing even more than we hate talking about blood and guts and other squicky things. But here is this person, rumored to be the son of God, the ultimate winner, one might think. And he's not only talking about eating flesh and drinking blood, but offering himself up as the meal. What is going on here? Is this teaching difficult because it hints at cannibalism? Or because it points to a level of sacrificial love that we can barely handle? Who's interested in a savior who's the biggest loser? How does he manage to sound so arrogant and so selfless all at the same time? Why bother coming down from heaven if you're just going to give yourself away when you get here? It's no wonder so many people went home. I thought this guy was the real deal, but he's just not making any sense at all. He wants us to do what now? He's going to get us all killed. Now this might be a good moment to remind us that John's Gospel does not include a narrative of the Last Supper. In that moment where the other Gospels do that, John offers us instead the story of Jesus washing the disciples' feet. But one could never argue that John didn't give us any Eucharistic theology. This chapter started with Jesus taking and blessing and breaking the bread and feeding the 5,000 with it. And now he's telling us just what that bread can do and what it represents. And even though he's talking about his own flesh and blood, we know that if we want to claim to be disciples, to be followers, Similar kinds of sacrifice may be asked of us one day. In chapter 15, Jesus will say, No one has greater love than this to lay down one's life for one's friends. Is it the flesh and blood talk or the injunction to sacrifice that is so hard? Is Jesus using flesh and blood talk to help us understand just how shocking the sacrifice may be. He knows that we hear eternal life and immediately think of victory, but what he wants us to understand is that the forces of death are not something we conquer by force, but something that can only be undermined by the power of sacrificial love. Over and over again, he says this, those who want to save their life will lose it. And those who lose their life for my sake will find it. This is a difficult teaching. Sometimes I wonder if the difficult teachings in the gospel are easier to dismiss because our lives me out here are actually too easy. 
Unlike Jesus' original audiences, we do not live under a violent occupation. Our refrigerators are usually full of food, and when they're not, there are drive throughs and grocery stores on every corner. We have access to toothpaste and pain meds and good shoes. Sometimes it takes a case of extreme deprivation to make us realize how deeply the sacrifices of Jesus can be embedded in our hearts. That's your content warning for what comes next. One of the most striking parts of the cannibalism exhibit at the Museum of Us is a 10 minute video about the tragedy of the Andes or the miracle of the Andes, depending on how you want to look at it. Many of you will remember when a plane crashed high in the Andes mountains in October of 1972. It was carrying primarily a Uruguayan rugby team and their members, their family members, on the way to a tournament in Santiago, Chile. The main reason for the crash was that the pilot was confused about where they were because of cloud cover, and that also meant that their fire radio communications had given inaccurate information about where they crashed. That confusion, combined with a white plane camouflaged in snow, meant that the search and rescue efforts failed and were called off in less than two weeks. The survivors had to do whatever they could to survive. And eventually, that meant subsisting on the sun-dried flesh of their fallen compatriots. The mental and emotional agonizing they went through as they gradually made that decision to do so is poignant and telling. They were mostly all faithful Catholics. They had grown up with the words this is my body for you, engraved on their hearts. Though they couldn't have the conversation with their companions who had died in the crash, among those who were still living, they solemnly gave permission for their own bodies to be used for sustenance if they were to die, which some of them later did in an avalanche that filled up the part of the plane they were sleeping. They actually brought up how this extreme act that they were forced into for their own survival was similar to communion. And for some of them, that was the only way they could bring themselves to partake. It's hard to imagine how they might have made sense of that if they weren't part of a faith tradition that upholds sacrificial love as the highest value. This isn't normally how laying down our lives for our friends plays out, thank Jesus. But it's one example of just how far this difficult teaching can take us. Now I trust that none of you are getting on a plane flight over the Andes anytime soon. Don't do it, I see you back there. <laughs> I hope that none of us will be faced with such impossible choices. But perhaps the extremity of that situation helps us understand why Jesus seems to be going for shock value in this discourse he's having after having fed 5,000 people and getting black for it. This weekend at our leadership retreat, we talked about all the things we do in church and in our lives that show how we love God with our hearts and our souls and our strength and our minds. The psalmist says, my soul longs, indeed it faints for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh sing for joy to the living God. It's been clear all along that our whole selves are invited into this journey of following Jesus, the one that nobody promised would be easy. But to whom would we go, we might ask, along with Peter? We have seen what the opposite of sacrificial love can do, the destruction wrought by unmitigated greed and selfishness, 
the damage caused by prejudice, the death brought about by regimes that pretend they can find security through violence. We have given in often to the temptation of delivering ourselves from evil, trying every other way we could think of because the way of Jesus is too scary. But here we are, and here is Jesus, offering us the words of eternal life. This is my body. This bread is my body broken for you. This cup is my blood shed for you. Where would we go? In, in just a bit, we will conclude the service singing, I will give my life for them. Whom shall I send? Will we go? Are we still here by Jesus' side, willing to face every difficult teaching, even the ones that make our stomachs queasy? We have been given bread for the journey if we are willing to share in it. Let us gather together the courage of our hearts and love. Hallelujah. response this morning is number 344. I have decided to follow Jesus. It is at this time that we invite forward anyone who wishes to join with this congregation by confession of faith in Christ as Lord and Savior or by transfer of membership from another congregation. It is at this time that we are all invited to rededicate our hearts and our lives to the ministry of Jesus Christ. Will you stand with me as you are able and sing?
Come on. It's a terrifying thing. Somehow, in some ways, on some days, that terrifying thing is expressed through our finances, even. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand, but you can raise the hand of your heart. If you have ever been terrified by your finances, you know who you are. Those are the moments when we know, when we need to know, when we need to trust that it is Jesus who walks alongside us. And that the bread of heaven will not fail us. Yesterday, look at that, it's still here. Yesterday, as we were using our theme scripture, we read the greatest commandment from this First Nations version. And the way they put it, that first commandment, says, Creator sets free, answered him, You must love the great spirit from deep within, with the strength of your arms, the thoughts of your mind, and the courage of your heart. To give something away takes courage. Which is why we are asked to bring our whole selves, including the courage of our hearts, when we do it. But also, we're not asked to do it alone. Though none go with me, I still will follow. We sing, but you don't actually have to do it that way. It doesn't have to be that hard. We can do it together. We can pile up the courage of all of our hearts, and it will make us bold. So let us come bravely, vulnerably. Let us come together and offer our gifts to God. And the deacons, please receive the offering. <laughs>
thank you for the many blessings you have bestowed upon us. As we offer these gifts, we ask for your continued favor. Bless these offerings and multiply their impact. May they bring comfort to the weary, hope to the hopeless, and joy to the sorrowful. Let our giving be a reflection of your love and grace. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please be seated. <clears throat> so many things one could say at this moment. Here we are, my friends, to share the bread and cup. We have discovered, Christians, over the many, many years and centuries that so often when Jesus was saying something, he was saying many things at the same time. And so we can come to this table confidently because any level of squickiness we may have been experienced can be soothed. It's bread. You've met bread. Bread is good. Bread is good for you. Carbohydrates, they are the fuel that keeps us going each day. It's a cup. We had a little conversation at the leadership retreat yesterday about our disciples' chalice logo with its big X through the wine glass. That must mean you don't like drinking. I mean, some people don't, but it also gives us an opportunity to point out how the fact that there isn't actual alcohol in these cups means the table is even more accessible to those for whom that could be a barrier. The cup is the mercy of God, whatever it tastes like. The bread is the source of life given to us by God. I don't think it was Jesus who said, you are what you eat. <laughs> Although maybe he did, and it just didn't get written down. But in a sense, he said, if you share in my body, if you share in my life, I will abide in you, and you will abide in me. And so we are invited again this day to remember that he took the bread and he blessed the bread and he broke the bread and he gave the bread to his disciples, saying, this bread is my body, broken for you. Eat of it, all of you, and remember me. In a similar way, he took the cup, and having given thanks, he poured it out for them, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, poured out for the forgiveness of sins. Drink of it, all of you, and remember me. And so we come to partake in the life of our Lord. Let us pray. Our Father, we come to this table not by compulsion, but because we want to be with you. You are our bread of life and our cup of living water. Be with us as we recite the prayer you taught our disciples so long ago. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Let us prepare our hearts to come to the table by singing our communion hymn number 421. Thank you.
us come with humble, joyful hearts. The deacons will invite you to come down the row and order. <laughs> and you may partake, uh, take the cup and, re and return to your seats to partake. Let us come with humble, joyful hearts. <laughs> Here I am, Lord. We will sing verses 1 and 3. 